All right, so let's jump right in. We have 45 minutes for this session. It goes fast. Uh, again, an engineered case. A 45-year-old premenopausal black woman presents with a newly diagnosed breast cancer. It was an invasive ductal carcinoma, grade 2, ER positive, PR positive, HER2 1 plus with a low KI67. On imaging, uh, this tumor measured 2.9 centimeters on ultrasound and by MRI. Um, there's no palpable adenopathy and by imaging, no evidence of abnormal uh, nodes. She has a sister who had breast cancer at age 54. Her genetic testing is negative. She undergoes a lumpectomy and sentinel lymph node, and there is a 3.2 centimeter grade one invasive ductal carcinoma that is resected with negative margins. Uh, unfortunately, one out of three sentinel lymph nodes is positive with a small tumor deposit of three millimeters, and she will undergo adjuvant radiation therapy. So the first question I'd like to tackle and ask to the panel is given the NCCN versus ASCO guideline recommendations regarding uh, utilizing genomic assays in premenopausal patients with lymph node positive disease. What has your approach been um, uh, to that situation? You want to start, Ruta? Sure. So I think, you know, the, I think the standard answer would be that we don't routinely use um, oncotype in these premenopausal women with lymph node positive cancer, one to three positive nodes. But there's definitely some features specifically of this case that would make you want to consider it um, and consider would she really need chemotherapy if she had, uh, because of the node positivity. She has a grade one tumor. Um, and even the lymph node involvement, it is, it is true metastatic disease in the lymph node, but it's three millimeters in one out of three sentinel nodes. Um, we do know that the oncotype is prognostic for these patients, and there's also some thought that maybe chemotherapy, especially, I think she was 54, was that her age? Mm -hmm. um, 54 premenopausal is, 45. Oh, sorry, 45. So um, in these uh, women who are near the age of their natural menopause is the benefit of chemotherapy that it puts them into uh, menopause early or really an ovarian suppression benefit from chemotherapy. So I think it could definitely be considered in this case. Um, to help guide systemic therapy. But again, I don't think it's the standard to do it in all these node positive premenopausal patients. Neil? Yeah, I, yeah, I agree. I think that the technical answer here is, is no, and this w the standard here would be to approach with chemotherapy. But um, I agree with Ruta's comments about the, some of the um, uh, uh, histologic features. That being said, um, I think we should you know, also discuss, or we will be discussing race here, and we know that um, mortality uh, in African Americans is 40% higher, uh, even when adjusting for biological differences. Uh, now, unfortunately, there are no predictive data uh, that race uh, is predictive of chemotherapy or, or therapy benefit or lack of benefit, so we really can't use it to predict or, or guide our therapies, but that, that does you know, uh, fall into my considerations when I think about how to approach uh, this particular patient. Mm -hmm. Matt? Do you want to take us through the Rx Bonder data and just share your thoughts on how you would approach this situation? Sure. So here's the Rx Ponder clinical trial that took women <clears throat> um, uh, who had uh, ER positive, HER2 negative, with one to three positive lymph nodes. Um, and these are patients that were um, um, uh, randomized. Well, first of all, a recurrence score was performed, recurrence score 0 to 25. These patients were randomized to either chemotherapy followed by endocrine therapy. Uh, versus endocrine therapy alone. Those patients that had a higher recurrence score uh, went off study and would have received standard chemotherapy. Um, the stratification factors you can see there were recurrence score, uh, menopausal status, and axillary surgery. Um, <clears throat> so uh, thinking a little bit about this particular study, I don't know if you want to go down to the next slide. Um, uh, the, this, uh, again, is, is something that we're all aware of, and that is the fact that there was this really di dichotomy between the outcomes of patients in postmenopausal versus premenopausal. Um, now, interestingly, you know, if you begin to look at the very long-term outcomes, even in Taylor RX that now were reported at San Antonio, there's a group of people that really would believe that the recurrence score truly is not necessarily predictive. In other words, that if you just have, you're identifying such a low-risk group of patients. 
um, that you know that the uh, Oncotype DX recurrent score um, identifies such a low risk group, r low risk group of patients that these patients don't need chemotherapy. My view on this is still that the data are very solid in postmenopausal women, and so I use the recurrent score in that particular setting. As you can see in the premenopausal group of patients, um, uh, there, there still was a benefit from chemotherapy. And of course, the great debate in this situation is that patients in, that were premenopausal did not receive uh, uh, sort of modern day uh, endocrine therapy. Uh, you can see that 84% um, and 75% of patients in these arms uh, received tamoxifen monotherapy. We know that simply adding ovarian function suppression improves disease-free survival and, and overall survival. We also know that adding an AI improves even further. So I think getting back to this question that you raised here, you know, um, I, I think there's a, there's a clear understanding why there's a debate in this situation, and because you know the ASCO is looking at it from a clear standpoint of well, we can only use an assay if it's predictive, and I don't I disagree with that. And I think the reality is is that in this situation the recurrent score has been shown to be more over and over and over prognostic. So there's value of having a prognostic assay. But I also think that <clears throat> there's enough uh, question here, uh, especially in the premenopausal setting of a group of patients where they did not receive adequate endocrine therapy. And my view is that it's important to inform patients of this. Um, and so <clears throat> I, the, the, this Answer, so this question is going to be fully answered in the uh, NRG09, uh, I think it's 009 study that Terry Mamunis will be running. And I think that will be ultimately uh, the, the, uh, the end of the debate, if you will. Um, but I think, and still then, we're going to have to weigh these two things. And I, I do think it's helpful to have a prognostic assay and to, to, to use this and to have this conversation with women. Because I have some women who just say, you know, you know, gets, I really don't want chemotherapy. And I say, okay, well, here are the pros and cons. Let's get it a recurrent score to help, the, to help us, uh, not necessarily tell us who's going to benefit from chemotherapy based on RX Ponder, but especially if you're in that lower risk population and we can use modern day um, endocrine therapy, those patients may be inclined to, to use a, an endocrine only approach. So given that you get that prognostic information, is there a certain cutoff that you use in your mind to make that decision of ovarian uh, suppression and endocrine therapy, like for example, we know that the benefit was seen in premenopausal women with a recurrent score of less than 25, but the absolute benefit is going to be based on what your, your prognosis is or what your baseline risk. So a premenopausal woman who had a recurrent score of 24, um, would you be more inclined to offer that woman chemo? And if it was more like 13, would you say, well, that's the patient that I would use endocrine therapy and OFS? And do we have any data to draw any line anywhere? Yeah, that, that's a really important question. I mean, as you can see right here, it doesn't look like there's a, a cutoff that tells us who will or will not benefit from chemotherapy. And again, that may be, of course, uh, related to the fact that chemotherapy may be having some endocrine ablation effects here. Um, <clears throat> and so, um, again, this is where we put all the data together. I think we, we need to be looking at not only uh, the information about um, you know, the recurrent score, but obviously the size of the tumor, the number of involved lymph nodes, um, and, and putting that all together will, will help us make a decision. So right now it doesn't look like there is uh, just, you know, an, um, you know uh, one recurrent score we can hang our hat on, but, it, but, but, the prognos but from the prognostic standpoint, you know, the higher the recurrent score, clearly the higher risk for, for recurrence. Um, and so <clears throat> just by that alone, as you mentioned earlier, the, the delta potentially is going to be greater in that situation. So this is where we can have that conversation with patients. To individualize, sure. And we saw similar findings in the MINDAC trial. Yeah, I think we're seeing very similar fi findings here in the MINDAC with, uh, with long, longer term outcome. This is distant metastases for su free survival. Uh, this is that clinical high risk, genomic low risk group of patients. Um, and uh, this is, um, again, the group of patients that we in the past would say, well, gee, I don't think they need chemotherapy uh, because they're genomic low risk. But here, again, you can see in this study, uh, if you look at patients aged 50 years or younger, 
uh, there appeared to be, you know, some benefit of chemotherapy. And again, both of <clears throat> MINDAC as well as RX Ponder randomization started in this older era where patients, many of them were not getting sort of modern day endocrine therapy. And so um, we can all say but perhaps this is a group of patients that um, if we had been treated with proper endocrine therapy, we wouldn't have seen this different. Again, it's hypothesis generating at this point and, and that's why the, uh, the NRG trial is going to be so important to finally lay this to rest. So in our case, um, the woman was black and there was some information that was presented at San Antonio with regards to some outcomes that we've seen um, based on ethnicity. Neil, I'll ask you to take us the, through these slides. Sure, <clears throat> sure. So um, this I thought was a very informative post hoc analysis of our expander uh, that was presented recently at San Antonio. And essentially they looked at outcomes IDFS um, by, by race and ethnicity. And a few points here, um, the majority of patients who participated in our expander, 70% uh, were Caucasian or white, uh, and the second most common uh, 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 racial subgroup were, were black patients, non-Hispanic black patients. Um, and in fact, um, uh, uh, Pacific Islanders uh, and Native Americans had to be excluded from the study because of the low incidence of those patients. So that being said, this did, this did allow for analyses that differentiated by the racial groups you see on the slide here. Uh, and you can see here that outcomes were worse for non-Hispanic uh, black patients uh, with a lower uh, IDFS rate, 87.2% in comparison to non-Hispanic white patients. And there were some additional analyses that looked at, for example, whether or not uh, compliance um, or treatment acceptance might have been, been contributory, and, and they were not. In fact, um, acceptance of treatment randomization was higher among non-Hispanic black women. Uh, uh, it was around 90, above 90 percent, uh, whereas for the non-Hispanic white population, it was uh, somewhere around 85 percent, uh, as well as compliance with endocrine therapy within the first year uh, was, was higher in the non-Hispanic black population. Uh, so, so those factors were not contributory uh, to, these, to these outcomes. The other thing to mention here um, is that when you look by, well, so here's, uh, here's the stratification by menopausal status, you still see worse outcomes uh, in the premenopausal group uh, if they're non-Hispanic black uh, women. Um, interestingly though, when uh, the models were adjusted by body mass index, uh, you actually lost some of this uh, effect here. Uh, and so I think we have to consider uh, a lot of factors here, biologic factors uh, and also um, uh, host factors uh, when we're thinking about prognostication. But overall, uh, these data uh, do indicate that uh, this is a particular population that we have to pay attention to and they have low or, or they have worse outcomes. One last thing I'll say is unfortunately, despite this prognostic finding, um, race was not predictive uh, of treatment benefit. Uh, and so as I mentioned, when we first opened uh, the session, uh, despite these worst outcomes, we still don't know uh, if race is a predictor of, of how we should be uh, modeling our therapies for this group. So Neil, I'll ask you a, kind of a provocative question. A few years ago, there was a publication looking at um, the use of uh, genomic assay, specifically Oncotype, and seeing that it under may underestimate risk in black women. I mean, should we be kind of starting all over and uh, looking to develop these assays that are more personalized for uh, patients that are, that are of uh, ethnicities um, other than what has already been studied? Yeah, you know, I think in the, in, certainly in the ideal world, um, we, would, we would look at, we would have studies that are specifically powered uh, to look at that question rather than subgroup analyses, which are almost always underpowered because of the unfortunate representation in most of our clinical trials. Um, but I think there's still a challenge there because um, in uh, large cohorts, observational studies, when you ad adjust by genomic factors, um, you still find a disparity in terms of, of outcomes. Uh, and it, these disparities are not necessarily fully explained by uh, social factors or social determinants. Uh, and I think that's partly because there are other host factors that are also differentially regulated uh, by race. 
uh, in, in black populations, Asian populations, Hispanic populations that also contribute to these differential outcomes. I mentioned the BMI issue. There are other host factors as well. Uh, so I think it's, it's a complex situation, and to truly get at that question that you posed, we would need a study that can address not just tumor-directed factors, uh, but both social determinants as well as host factors. Can, can I just follow up on that? I think one of the, and, and to follow up what Neil said, it is really important, is there's a lot of focus here, uh, obviously, on the <clears throat> non-Hispanic blacks doing worse, but it's interesting as well that the Asians are doing better. So the, uh, and so that does, really does beg the question that, that Neil mentioned, are there really, there's some host factors. Um, you lose some of these effects when you adjust for BMI, um, and should that be a major focus of our uh, studies going forward and looking at host and metabolic factors that might be driving some of these differences? Great points. So now let's go to a second case, a 59-year-old postmenopausal woman who presents with a 3.5 centimeter left breast cancer on biopsy invasive ductal carcinoma, grade two, ER 80%, PR 10%, HER2 1 plus, KI 67 is 40% here. She has no palpable axillary nodes, but axillary ultrasound identified three abnormal lymph nodes with cortical thickening, and a percutaneous biopsy was positive for metastatic adenocarcinoma to the lymph nodes with clips placed. Germline testing reveals a BRCA2 pathogenic mutation. In terms of uh, treatment, she receives neoadjuvant chemotherapy with four cycles of AC, 12 cycles of weekly paclitaxel, and is able to achieve a partial clinical and imaging response with some decrease in the size of the breast mass on imaging, axillary nodes normalizing, and at the time of surgery, she undergoes lumpectomy and seed localized sentinel lymph node uh, surgery, a targeted axillary dissection. And you see her pathology from her surgery here, a 2.8 centimeter IDC grade three with one out of three lymph nodes positive and important to note that one of the clip nodes was positive. So we have a surgeon on the panel um, I should have asked you to introduce yourself, and also, Matt, sorry, I didn't ask you both to um, just say hello and name your institution. Maybe we could start with that. Okay, go ahead. Hi, Matthew Getz from Mayo Clinic in Rochester. I'm Clara Park. I'm a breast surgical oncologist at the Ohio State University. Okay. So welcome to both of our new panelists. So here is a question. A sentinel lymph node biopsy targeted axillary dissection shows a positive lymph node after neoadjuvant therapy. What is the standard of care for axillary management? So um, here are the options, regional nodal radiation therapy alone, uh, completion axillary lymph node dissection and regional nodal radiation therapy, completion axillary lymph node dissection only or none of the above. So we're not going to actually um, vote on this here, but it's kind of a starting point for Clara. Maybe you can take us through some of this data. Sure, so neoadjuvant chemotherapy in ER positive HER2 negative patients, the NCCN guidelines recommends for op inoperable disease such as inflammatory breast cancer or extent when there's extensive nodal involvement or clinical T4 disease. So that is a pretty straightforward scenario, but I think when we have operable disease, this is where some of the debate can occur between the medical oncologist and the surgeon, which one should we do first, especially uh, for the purposes of decreasing the size of tumor, where you are hoping to render the patient, quote, lumpectomy eligible, and also for the purposes of converting a positive node into a negative node with the idea, with the intent that you would be able to omit axillary lymph node dissection. And so the question becomes, what are the chances of downstaging uh, ER positive HER2 negative disease with systemic therapy? And I, there, are some, there are many nomograms out there, and there are many other predictive elements, such as using KI-67 now more readily, using age as a predictive factor. This is one of the nomograms, and you can see here if we kind of input the patient's data, if you click on through it, this particular nomogram from MD Anderson doesn't include KI-67. I don't know if you can click through. But the 
basically when I inputted this particular case, the patient's probability of converting to no negative disease is around 20 percent. And that's where a lot of the previous published studies have demonstrated for ER positive, HER2 negative disease, the chances of going from node positive disease to no negative disease is around 20 percent. Obviously those chances increase when you have triple negative, it's around 50 percent, and when it's HER2 positive with modern HER2 therapy, it's upwards of 60 to 70 percent. And so we understand as surgeons that the chances of avoiding axillary lymph node dissection is low in this population, and so the type of operation that we are offering to the patient will likely not change. Next slide. Now comes the question of how do you manage surgically the axilla after systemic therapy? So let's say we agree, let's treat with systemic therapy first. What do you do? When it's a negative node, going to a negative node, that's pretty straightforward. Sentinel lymph node biopsies, data from SNFNAC, Z1071, and the Centina trial all demonstrate that this is safe to do. Also from negative node to positive node, this is where some of the confusion can occur because in Z11 and Amaro's trials, when there was a negative sentinel node, we are now omitting completion axillary lymph node dissection. However, it's really important to remember that both in Z11 and Amaro's, patients were treated with surgery first. So in the neoadjuvant setting, that data does not apply. And so if it's a negative node previously, but the sentinel lymph node is positive, then I would do a completion axillary lymph node dissection. In addition, obviously, uh, if the node is clinically still positive uh, in the last, last column here, I would still do a completion axillary lymph node dissection. One of the newest data comes from the third row where it's a previously biopsy proven positive lymph node that now converts to clinically negative lymph node and the patient undergoes a sentinel lymph node biopsy or targeted axillary lymph node dissection. You can click on and what the data from Z1071 demonstrated is that if we perform a standard sentinel lymph node biopsy, whether it's done with a single tracer or a dual tracer, the false negative rate is around 10 percent. And clinic, in clinical trials, an acceptable false negative rate would be under 10 percent. But what data from SNFNAC and Centina has demonstrated is that the number of lymph nodes actually does help decrease the false negative rate. Using dual tracer, meaning technetium, in addition to a blue dye, does help decrease the false negative rate below 10 percent. And in addition, retrieving the previous biopsy proven positive lymph node also helps decrease the false negative rate. Next slide. And so that's what targeted axillary lymph node dissection is. The name is kind of unfortunate because it gives the impression that we're doing a full dissection, but technically, basically what we're doing is we're placing a localizing marker, whether it's a seed or a wire, into the previously biopsied metastatic lymph node with the intent of retrieving that lymph node for pathologic analysis. In addition, we're pr performing a sentinel lymph node biopsy. And this is done after neoadjuvant therapy. Again, some confusion right now with the data being kind of dripped into the non-neoadjuvant setting. But right now, the study has demonstrated this uh, in neoadjuvant therapy setting. And when the, the, this, the study initially by Dr. Abigail Cottle from Indy Anderson demonstrated that the false negative rate, when you retrieve that positive lymph node, in addition to the sentinel lymph node biopsy, the false negative rate is below 4%, so very reliable in performing this operation. This, the, the data here, as well as the most recently presented San Antonio data from Memorial Sloan Kettering, neither of those data indicate what to do if the lymph node is still positive. And so this is more of the question of is the false negative rate below 10 percent. The most recent San Antonio data demonstrated, however, that in the prospective non-randomized setting that the local regional recurrence rate is around three, uh, 1 percent at three years to five years survival. And so what can we leave the lymph nodes alone if they're still positive or not? Ultimately, that question will be answered with the Alliance A11202 trial data. 
So before we move off of this, um, Christina, you know, the discussions we've been having have implications um, from, from your aspect in terms of radiation. Um, how, how do you incorporate this into, into your decision making? So I think that Alliance 11202 study will be very informative um, because that includes patients who have you know, T1 to T3, N1 disease up front pathologically confirmed. They then have neoadjuvant chemotherapy and become clinically no negative, but then at the time of their surgery will have pathologically confirmed lymph nodes. And then there the randomization would be to completion axillary dissection followed by regional nodal radiation or just regional nodal radiation alone. So again, trying to see if we can de-intensify some of the surgical management of the of the axilla. Um, so hopefully we'll see you know, whether or not um, there's comparable local control. You know, a lot of times, um, as you mentioned, you know, Z11 or Amaros are brought up, but those patients didn't receive neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Um, but Amaros did teach us that you know, the local control was comparable between completion dissection versus radiation. Um, and doing radiation rather than the lymph node dissection was able to spare our patients the morbidity of lymphedema, which is quite significant from a quality of life perspective for our patients. So I think, you know, with that philosophy, you know, there's a lot of ongoing studies right now trying to see, um, you know, whether we can de-intensify even radiation fields to minimize lymphedema. So another study that often comes up in this setting is NSABP B51, which is still not reported, but, in the, but for those patients, you know, they all had pathologically confirmed lymph nodes, neoadjuvant chemotherapy, but they actually had a pathologic complete response. And then the randomization there is standardized regional nodal radiation versus um, no nodal radiation in those patients. And then even still factoring in recurrence score, you know, there's the MA39 um, Taylor RT study that's basically looking at patients who have lymph node positive disease and a recurrence score less than 18. And then the randomization there is actually seeing if we can omit regional nodal radiation as well. So I think there's a lot of exciting ongoing studies to see if we'll be able to de-intensify the radiation fields. Um, I wish I had an image, but you know, it's also, I think, important to kind of unpack what we mean by some of these fields. Um, so when a radiation oncologist is saying, you know, regional nodal radiation, a lot of times that's, you know, the undissected axillary lymph nodes, the supraclavicular field, as well as internal mammary chain. I mean, if we think of the Z11 patients, a lot of those patients were breast conservation patients. And so our standard radiation fields with tangents actually usually also inc include some of the proximal level 1, 2 axilla. So, you know, there have been subsequent analyses looking at the Z11 fields, and when they actually parse through those data, you know, you actually see that there's some heterogeneity in terms of field design. So some of those patients got more of an intentional, full comprehensive lymph node coverage with the undissected axilla as well as supracleft fields. Others got so-called high tangents, where the radiation oncologist kind of cheats and you know, treats some of the undissected axilla and the low supraclav. Um, and so I think some of these ongoing studies now looking at um, omission of radiation, it's important for us to actually you know, tease apart what is meant by those fields so that we can hopefully make main, more informed decisions as we you know, subsequently design our radiation fields for our patients. <coughs> Great. Thank you for those comments. Can I make just one of more course. comment? Um, you know, I think one of the things that's interesting is <clears throat> in this era of uh, uh, positive lymph node post neoadjuvant chemotherapy, um, obviously there's a variety of uh, header, there's a lot of different biological subsets. Um, you know, triple negative is, is obviously different than ER positive or two negative. And I think what's happening in, in the midst of the trial design like A011202, which is a very important trial, um, you know, we're, we're changing our therapy. So all of a sudden we're giving, you know, adjuvant of emaciclib, which is reducing the risk for both local and distant recurrence. So the other day I asked Vera Suman, who is the uh, primary statistician for A011202, because I had a similar question. I said, Vera, when do you think we're going to have these data? And she said, well, maybe five to seven years. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be a while until actually A011202 comes out. And I think in, in, until then, we're going to be faced with this question of, you know, how intense do we really go? So. Right. So just to make sure that everybody hears the question, um, what, what would you all do now? We went through the data, but put you on the spot with the data we have, what would you do? I think in the setting of ongoing clinical trials, the safest thing to do is a completion axillary lymph node dissection with regional nodal radiation therapy in the setting of persistent positive lymph node in the axilla. And yes, everyone touts the 
lymph node dissection is the devil, and yes, so we are worried about lymphedema, but there are now newer surgical therapies to help reduce the risk of lymphedema, such as lymphovenous bypass and lymph node transfers, and so there are an axillary reverse mapping. So there are ongoing uh, surgical management therapies that are evolving to help reduce the risk of lymphedema with ALND. Can okay, I just add there, sure. It, one, just one comment is that this is also another area where I think race is going to be incredibly important. We saw data at San Antonio that after, the, after neoadjuvant treatment uh, in the setting of residual disease, uh, the, the immune cell infiltrate in the microenvironment can ha is actually differential by race. And we also know that um, lymph there's a higher risk of lymphedema in non-Hispanic black patients. And this is probably also related to microenvironment changes. There's an ongoing study at MSK that's looking at adipose biology and, and immune cell infiltrates as a biological reason for racial differences in, in lymphedema risk. So I think as, as these ongoing trials result, uh, analyzing by race is going to also be a very important uh, area. Great, thank you all for your comments. As I've been reading this question, I caught a couple typos. Um, so I'll point those out. Uh, in a high-risk premenopausal ER positive HER2 negative germline BRCA mutation carrier who meets the criteria for both adjuvant olaparib and adjuvant, it should say, abemacyclib, uh, which systemic therapy would you recommend? The other typo I caught is, remember, this is a premenopausal patient, so all of the responses that include adjuvant AI should include ovarian function suppression. So here are your options, adjuvant AI for five years plus uh, OFS, adjuvant tamoxifen along with two years of abemacyclib, adjuvant AI along with one year of olaparib, again, uh, plus OFS, adjuvant AI along with one year of olaparib and two years of uh, abemacyclib, so meaning both targeted treatments given concurrently. Um, so before, uh, Ruda, you take us through uh, these data, do you want to give us your response to the question? Sure. So I think, you know, in a patient who meets the criteria for both, it's, a, it's always a challenge, but I would lean towards doing the olaparib, knowing um, the data with the germline BRCA mutation carriers and the targeted therapy um, that Elaborib provides. Mm -hmm. Neil, do you feel the same? I, I do feel the same. I would probably follow that with a mm -hmm. So sequential. Right. Okay. I agree. Matt? I agree completely. Uh huh. Same. Okay. So we have a consensus. All right. With that, do you want to take us through? Sure, so this is the Olympia trial, um, and this is what really has established Olaparib in the adjuvant setting for these germline uh, BRCA1 and 2 mutation carriers. So these patients had local genetic testing or on-study central testing, and again, they had to have a germline pathogenic or likely pathogenic mutation in BRCA1 or 2. They were HER2 negative, so that includes both the hormone receptor positive as well as the triple negative cohort and they were stage two to three breast cancers or patients who had a lack of pathologic complete response to neoadjuvant chemotherapy. So there's really two groups here. There's the neoadjuvant group, and to qualify, these patients, if they were triple negative, were non-PCRs. If they were hormone receptor positive, they were non-PCRs, and they had a CPS EG score of three or higher. So these were the patients who had received six or more cycles of neoadjuvant chemotherapy followed by surgery with or without radiation. Patients could also enroll in the adjuvant group. These were triple negative patients who had uh, tumors that were PT2 or higher or PN1 or higher. And if they were hormone receptor positive, they had four or more positive lymph nodes. So these were patients who had surgery followed by adjuvant chemotherapy of six or more cycles plus or minus radiation. There were 1,800 patients who were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to either Olaparib twice a day for a year or placebo twice a day for a year with the primary endpoint of invasive disease-free survival. And here you can see the primary endpoint. Um, the hazard ratio here was 0.58, showing a superiority of Olaparib versus placebo with, the three, uh, with a difference in three-year IDFS rates of 8.8%. The statistical design of the study was such that they would look at distant disease-free survival if IDFS was significant. So here you see the result of distant disease-free survival. Hazard ratio 0.57, 
and a difference in three-year DDFS rates of 7.1%. And here's the overall survival. So in the Olaparib arm, there were 59 deaths, 55 due to breast cancer. In the placebo arm, 86 deaths, 82 due to breast cancer. Hazard ratio of 0.68, but this was not significant based on the statistical plan. There was a three-year overall survival rate difference of 3.7%. So before we go through the Abema data, um, just one comment about toxicity of Olaparib because there was some concern about MDS, AML. Um, you want to comment on that just verbally since we didn't include those slides? Sure. So I think, um, you know, it hasn't been shown to be a significant issue um, in the adjuvant setting. I think, you know, we do have to think about the toxicity that the patients have while they're on it, um, and a lot of those are hematologic toxicities that we continue to monitor mm -hmm. while they take it. Mm -hmm. So with that, Neil, do you want to take us through some of the updated data that was presented at San Antonio with regards to follow-up on the Monarchy trial? Sure. Yeah. So we, as, as you mentioned, we saw uh, extended follow-up data at San Antonio from Monarchy, which looked at both uh, updated IDFS as well as uh, the first interim uh, overall survival uh, analysis. Uh, and so the first thing to comment here is that uh, by the time of this analysis, all patients had completed uh, their two years of adjuvant uh, abemacyclib. Uh, and I believe the follow-up time at this point was close to four years. Uh, and what we see here is a deepening in the magnitude of difference of IDFS benefit uh, between the endocrine therapy alone arm uh, and the abemacyclib plus uh, endocrine therapy arm. Uh, there you can see the, the accentuated hazard ratio uh, of 0 0.66 uh, and a, a significant uh, improvement uh, in IDFS rates uh, in those patients that were treated uh, with abemacyclib uh, in this longer term follow-up. If we go to the next slide, um, you can now see here the, uh, the distant recurrence-free survival and similarly uh, we see a deepening uh, in the benefit uh, of uh, abemacyclib uh, in this longer follow-up. Uh, next slide. So here um, we also see that there were fewer deaths uh, in the patients that were treated with abemacyclib as well as um, the rates of metastatic disease. Uh, so overall this data is consistent uh, with the IDFS and, and disease uh, distant recurrence-free survival data uh, that we showed on the prior slide. And then on the next slide we'll uh, take a look at the interim overall survival uh, data. Uh, it still remains uh, immature at this point, um, at two years. Uh, we don't see a separation uh, of the curves. Uh, nonetheless, with a deepening uh, in the magnitude of benefit uh, in terms of disease-free survival or distant recurrence-free survival, as well as the lower rate of deaths uh, from metastatic disease in the bemacyclib uh, containing arm, we're, we're continuing to obviously wait with anticipation for the uh, final uh, overall survival uh, analysis. So this is the end of the slides, but we, we do have time for questions. Um, and before we even get to the questions, again, getting back to the uh, point about toxicity of these therapies, because that's really important. Uh, Neil, can you talk to us, and maybe Komal and Matt, all of you who treat patients with adjuvant abema, what has your experience been? Uh, because two years is a long time to deal with uh, the toxicities that are described here. Um, you know, sometimes there are paper toxicities, and then there are other kinds of paper toxicities. So um, yeah. that factors in. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. You know, I, I think it's interesting because in discussions with colleagues, there seems to be such a broad variety uh, of what people are experiencing with adjuvant, some of these adjuvant extended therapies in, in clinic. In my own experience, I find that uh, it's, al it's almost a, a dichotomous experience where I have patients who seem to be perfectly fine and, and they sail through. We know that common AEs with abemacyclib include uh, uh, GI disturbances, particularly diarrhea, as well as cytopenias can occur, although to a somewhat lesser degree uh, uh, than other CDK4-6 inhibitors. Uh, nonetheless, um, I find in my own experience that uh, I have a group of patients that after having undergone, I mean, these are high-risk patients, right, so having uh, undergone chemotherapy and, and the variety of, of local therapies, uh, then they come to the endocrine therapy, uh, which by it, uh, in and of itself can be uh, a challenge. Uh, 
uh, and then we escalate that uh, with CDK4-6 inhibition, um, that can be a, a significant challenge, um, both in terms of the, the diarrhea and the neutropenia that I mentioned, although neutropenia less so, but also just day to day, I find that folks have difficulty sometimes with fatigue and, and um, even accentuated arthralgia. Um, but I also have a category of, of, of patients who seem to just be able to power through. It's actually quite impressive. Um, and so my approach has been um, I'm going to offer it uh, to folks that um, meet the criteria. And I counsel folks that you know, we, we can always adjust as needed uh, once we understand how their, how their particular experience will be uh, on therapy. Matt or Komal, did you want to add anything? I think the only other <clears throat> comment I'll say is that you know the the uh, trial uh, enrolled very high risk patients, so four or more positive lymph nodes, or if you had one to three positive lymph nodes, you had to other have other high risk factors such as a large tumor T uh, uh, tumor size greater than five centimeters or high grade. So I think that helps a little bit. You know, um, you know, if patients say, you know, well, gee, I, you know, that um, they can actually see the data. We can show it to them. Um, you know, the the rates of recurrence are relatively high, especially, you know, if we further add in the KI-67 data, we can identify a group of patients that, you know, are recurring, um, you know, 25, 30 percent or even higher within this four-year period of time. So I think knowing that helps patients stay on therapy a little bit longer. You know, if you had a, you know, one centimeter tumor and we were trying to do this, it would be impossible, I think. Um, so I agree with Neil. Uh, overall, I think, you know, the one thing certainly I tell patients is that, you know, if you're not tolerating it, we stop and give a break and we try a dose reduction. And uh, many patients can actually do well with dose reductions. Uh, we haven't seen those data from the uh, adjuvant monarch and, uh, each study in terms of how patients did or did not do with regard to dose reductions. Uh, but we do have some data from the metastatic setting which suggests that it was not deleterious to reduce dose for those patients that had side effects. So um, I, I think we can get most of these high-risk patients through. Obviously, there are some patients that, that have a lot of difficulties, uh, but otherwise, um, I, I think that um, knowing the, the degree or the risk of disease can help patients sort of push through here. So as we move to the virtual questions in the last couple minutes, I'll just take uh, one uh, or I'll uh, read one brief question on this systemic therapy uh, decision because I think we've had a really nice discussion and then there are some questions on lymphedema uh, management. Um, so the question was, so no concurrent abema and olaparib, would you treat with abema first or olaparib first? I think we all were clear that we would treat with olaparib first. Um, certainly no safety data for the combination and even the sequential strategy that we're bringing up, I would just caution that we don't have data for that. But when you see a patient with N2, N3 disease, germline BRCA carrier and we have tools in our toolbox, there is this feeling of this kitchen sink approach that you want to use, but again, this is not something that we have clear data for. Um, anyone want to add? So the question is with regards to the FDA approval, which mandates a high KI-67 versus the patients that were enrolled in a Monarch E that, um, you know, the intent to treat population, what are you all doing? So I think it's important to know, too, that um, ASCO and NCCN sort of broadened um, the FDA indication to, to be more representative of who was on the clinical trial. So I haven't had um, trouble with insurance approval uh, with a low KI-67 if they met some of the other criteria, like it had more than four positive nodes, for example. Okay, so the last question, and then I want to make sure that we keep on time. Um, a couple questions through the virtual chat regarding management of lymphedema. Many patients are diagnosed. It seems that there's, you know, an opportunity for maybe better education about how to prevent and care for lymphedema. Um, and is there any organization that you're all aware of uh, that, that really focuses on this? So maybe Christina and Clara, I can ask you both from your perspectives to comment on lymphedema management. Well, in our institution, we try to prospectively send all patients to physical therapy to get upfront measurements even before their surgery or radiation. And then usually they're plugged in to be able to get physical therapy during the course of their radiation and then thereafter. 
And we've looked at our own institutional kind of quality improvement, and we've seen that I think when patients are more aware of the symptoms to look for, um, and then also feel like they have an active team kind of managing it throughout their treatment journey, um, at least their quality of life improves. And then we know that lymphedema is just one of those problems where kind of once it gets too far gone, it's very hard to improve, so prevention is very much important. Um, so I think prospectively getting arm circumference measurements, we use a SOZO machine in our clinic, um, which uses bioimpedance and is you know, non-invasive and is able to provide us very granular kind of arm circumference data. Um, that's been very helpful. Um, and then we have some various community resources to be able to refer patients to for extra funding for sleeves and physical therapy um, once their insurance benefits run out. I fully agree with everything that uh, Dr. Beal said about prevention and early s detection and surveillance. I think those are very important things and also there's a lot even in my own institution still sort of uh, old wives tales or myths about lymphedema and I think it's really important to note that patients in the past were quote blamed for lymphedema development for example oh you weren't supposed to do heavy lifting or except you weren't supposed to do X, Y, and Z, and that's why you develop lymphedema. And studies have shown that that's not the case. It's activity is safe to do. It's okay to get blood pressure measurements and IVs. If you don't have lymphedema, it doesn't cause lymphedema. And so I think addressing some of those uh, concerns where oftentimes patients fear that they have caused the lymphedema is also important. Early detection is critical because often in stage one lymphedema, you can reverse a lot of the symptoms if you detect it early and you manage it early on. In our institution, we also have several different modes to address patients with severe lymphedema, including surgical techniques, uh, as mentioned before, regarding lymphatic bypass, lymph node transfers, and other different modalities to surgically manage lymphedema as well. Thank you all for a great panel discussion. Um, I forgot my moderator notes. Are we going right into the targeted session? Okay, so Komal will take over with moderating this session. Thank you all.